I'm glad you're here today. We're going to be in the book of Colossians chapter 2. And if you do have your Bibles, I would invite you to open to Colossians chapter 2. I'm excited to be here. Um, I'm very humbled to be able to preach God's Word, so I don't take this lightly. Um, I, I love doing this. And by the way, my name is Chet. For those of you who are new, we're excited you're here. I'm one of the pastors on staff, and we're glad you're here. I hope you found this place very welcoming. There are a lot of beautiful faces. I mean, look around. Someone turn to your left or your right and say, you have a beautiful face. <laughs> Some of you just lied, but it's okay. We can ask God for forgiveness. It'll be all right. Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 through 7. Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, having been firmly rooted and now being built up in him and established in your faith, just as you were instructed, and overflowing with gratitude. You see, therefore, that indicates that Paul, the author of this letter, wrote something of importance before verse 6. So just a quick recap before we start loosening these bolts and try to apply them to our life. He was letting the church know that they should love one another in unity. You see, there was some division going on within the church. So Paul was reminding them, hey guys, we're held together by love. This is important. We need to be unified as the church. And of course, he told these things to the church because he wanted the church to have one focus, and that focus be the Lord Jesus Christ. Because we come with many, many hurts and many pains this morning, but what I want and desire for us to do is to focus on the one true hope that cannot be taken away from us, and that's Jesus Christ. So that's why we come here on Sunday morning. We have something to proclaim. We have something to declare. That's the Word of God. That's the work of Christ in it, and that it can work through our life. So if you're not a little bit excited this morning, I would invite you to get excited with me because God's Word is active and it's living, and what it says can be applied to your life as well as mine. So let's get started. Number one, receiving indicates that something was given. Colossians chapter 2, verse 6, you have received Christ Jesus the Lord. Oh, this is good. Don't miss this. You see, Jesus was given. He was sent by God for us. He purchased us back from the slavery of death and affliction. You see, in Old Testament times, slaves would have to have their freedom purchased. And so if you would go to the slave owner and say, hey, I want, I want to pay for this slave. I need this person back. I want to free this person. Then you would give that slave owner money. It's the same with Jesus. We were enslaved to sin and bondage and death. But when Jesus bled on the cross and he rose from the grave, that literally gave, it, gave us a ticket into freedom. And it's up to us whether or not we're going to take that ticket and cash it in because we have to believe. It means to purchase with a price. The price was Jesus' life. You see, that story should never get old in our life. There should be a resounding beat of that drum, the gospel drum within us that says, I have hope and glory in Jesus Christ and no matter what happens to me on this earth, I know where I stand. And I know my identity is in Christ. He died on a torture device. He was buried in a borrowed tomb. And he rose from the dead. You see, this is the foundation that we seek. God gives every one of us when we're born a desire to seek eternity. And why did he do that? Well, he did that because he knew his plan would be fulfilled through that one ticket, that one fulfillment, that one foundation, Jesus Christ. So the question is this, when people look at us, do they see the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, or do they see us? Number two, learning to walk can be confusing and painful. Colossians 2, that second part of verse 6, so walk in him. You see, I think a lot of times we, we look over that preposition there, in. There's a verb before it and a pronoun after. It's connecting the two. So that means in Christ, we should take action by walking in him. So Caden, my two-year-old, he learned how to walk about 18, 19 months. You know, he's a late bloomer. And uh, so it kind of went like this in our house. We set him up. Caden, you, you can walk, buddy. I know you can do it. You got this, okay? And we'll walk across the room. Caden, come on. Come on, buddy. You can do it. You can do it. Come on. Sometimes I felt like, like if someone would listen to an audio tape in our home, they would think we have a dog. 
right? We're like, come on, Caden, you got it, buddy. You can do it. And then he don't walk, so we walk over. Hey, hey, buddy, you can do it. Look, just lift your hands up and just start walking. You got it. You got it. Come on, Caden. Come on, Caden. You can do it. I mean, like 30 minutes pass. We're exhausted. We're ready to just put him to bed and go to sleep, right? It could be painful and confusing, but until Caden would take that first step, he wouldn't know that he had the ability to walk. And the same is with us in God. You see, God wants us to take those steps of faith in him. But he, he's, he's calling us, he's nudging us, but he's not going to make us walk. He wants us to make that decision to walk. And he wants to make that decision in Christ first. But then after that, he calls us to different steps of obedience according to who we are, how we're built, the calling on our life. And of course, last but not least, the immeasurable love and grace that God has for us. You see, we need to be willing to step out in faith. You see, most of the time, those first steps of uncertainty prove to be the times that we learn more about God and experience Him more than ever in our life. God blesses obedience. He blesses those who walk in Christ. It's this picture of striving to be like, more like Him in all our ways. Now, does that mean life is going to be easy? No, not at all. Not at all, but we have a promise that we have one true king that will bring us through those times. You see, we can't know how Jesus reacted or how he communicated unless we read it in Scripture. And so what I want to do is I want to show you guys something. I think this is so powerful in God's word. You see, when Jesus encountered people, he encountered them with love and compassion. And because he encountered people with love and compassion, they responded in faith. You see, I was guilty of this in the beginning of my walk with Christ, I would walk up to someone and just preach the gospel and, and not really hear what they have to say or care about their concerns. I would just say, hey, you're going to hell. You need to accept Jesus now. Well, I learned that wasn't very effective. That's probably why we quit, quit getting spit on. What I did learn is from Jesus. And when Jesus approached someone, he asked them questions. He listened to them. He loved them. He had compassion on them. Compassion drives us to do things that's uncomfortable. When you are brokenhearted for the brokenhearted, God calls you to do some things that's uncomfortable. And it's in those moments that you can be so blessed by sacrificing whatever it is God's calling you to sacrifice for him and for that person. But what do we do? We're so quick to judge. Oh, that person put themselves in that circumstance I don't really need to help because it's their fault. Well, I didn't see Jesus do that in the scriptures. And so if we're supposed to be Christians and walk in him, then we need to do what he did. Ephesians 5.1. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. So those of you, I was in this category, will say, well, I'm not Jesus, I'm not perfect, so I don't think I can love and have compassion like Jesus did. Ephesians 5.1. Be imitators of God as beloved children. If you don't have compassion for people or if you don't have a broken heart for the lost, have you ever tried to pray for it? <laughs> you see, I think we're so quick to inundate our prayer list with those who need things, but we forget to pray for our own souls. We forget to pray for the fiery passion inside of us to share Jesus and to love people and to be that light in this dark world. My friends, if you find yourself dry this morning, I challenge you today to ask God to fill you with compassion for people and wait and see what happens. <laughs> when you're overcome with compassion for someone, you are often called out into action. So be, be ready. Be ready. Oh, but it's such a blessing. It's such a blessing. In order to have compassion, we have to be free. Are you free this morning? Or are you carrying around so much baggage that your back is about to break? Do you have so many bags of past burdens and hurts that you can't walk free? Well, hey, I got a word for you this morning. It's called the book of Matthew, chapter 11, verse 28 through 30. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. 
for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I don't know about you, but that sounds like a good deal. That sounds like something I want in my life. I want to wake up in the morning and be free, no matter the circumstance. I want to wake up in the morning with a desire to serve the God who loves me, the God who saved me, the God who took me out of death and placed me into life, the God who has promised me eternal security. Who wouldn't want to serve that God, y'all? I mean, come on. These burdens that we carry around, they were put on the cross. It's been done. It's past tense. We talked about prepositions. We're going to talk about tenses. You didn't know you could get an English lesson today, did you? Past tense is when the cross, the work of the cross, Jesus dying on it, happened. The ramifications, the consequences, the blessings of Jesus' work on the cross is happening now and will happen in the future. So we can count on that. All you have to do is take that first step in faith and uncertainty. Because we as people like to know what we're getting into. I mean, I'm like that. If I'm given a task, I'm like, okay, A, B, C, D. You know, I, I got a list. I need to know, okay, what time. That, that's how my brain works. But sometimes God calls us to do some things that we're just not so sure about. But that's when we have to trust his word. How good is the gentle heart of our loving Lord Jesus? You see, I think sometimes we get this view of God, this, this figure in heaven that all he wants to do is discipline us, and all he wants to do is, is go against our will, and all he wants to do is fight with us. Well, guys, this is the deal. If you're transformed by the Holy Spirit, your wants and your desires and your passions and your loves will be transformed to meet God's passions, desires, and his loves for you in your life. Our souls will always have some trouble this side of heaven, but there's freedom in Christ. There's freedom in Christ. So, number three. Roots run deep, <clears throat> or do they? Colossians 2, 7, having been firmly rooted. Now, this is so important because we live in an individualistic society. As soon as we turn 18, we're ready to live on our own. We're ready to have our own bills, which is just crazy. I don't know why I thought that. That was so dumb. I look back, I'm like, man, I should have stayed with pops and moms for a couple of years and just saved some money. But it didn't happen. So we have this idea in society today that we can do everything by ourselves. And that's a dangerous view. And that's why a lot of people today are struggling in their faith because they're not deeply rooted in Jesus Christ and they're not deeply rooted in the foundation of the body of Christ. Redwood trees. How many of you guys have ever seen a redwood tree? I am so jealous of you. I've seen pictures. Yeah, how many of you guys have seen a picture? <laughs> Just about everybody else, yeah. I would love to check out these trees. They're fascinating. There's a couple of things I want to share with you. Their roots only go about five to six feet in the ground. These trees are massive. They grow up to 350 feet tall, and their roots only go five to six feet in the ground. Now, how can a tree that big and that massive be able to stand? And how can it withstand high winds and raging waters? Look at this pick. The redwood tree roots don't go deep, but they intertwine with one another. And so they use each other as stability and strength. And what I want to reference is us intertwining our roots with Jesus today. Because if we intertwine our roots with Jesus, we will find that we can withstand these insurmountable tasks, these insurmountable circumstances in life with strength and endurance. But we have to be willing to root ourselves in him. You see, some of us want to do it by ourselves. But we all know what will happen without the proper support. So if these trees would not root themselves in one another, the high winds would topple them over, raging floods would uproot them, and they would be extinct. They wouldn't exist. So with our souls, with our bodies, with our lives, God's word calls us to be firmly rooted in the promise of Jesus Christ. Yes, he's not standing here face to face this morning, but his word is true. And if you take a step of faith and believe in him as your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, you will find that your roots won't have to go deep, but they will be strong no matter what happens in life. You will have unshakable support by the power of the Holy Spirit. 
Look at Ephesians 3.17. Let's see, how did Jesus do his ministry with such spirited intensity? Let's see it. Verse 7, verse 7, 17. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, he did it with love. God is love. 1 John 4, 8. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. Love is action. Love is kind. Love has compassion. So before we judge that person, let's take a minute and step in their shoes. Before we look at somebody and place a label on them, let's walk in their shoes. Let's look at them through the lens of Jesus Christ and see how can we influence the gospel in their life. I feel we're so busy with our schedules and we're so busy with, with things going on in our life that we forget God has given us an avenue. He has given us an opportunity to influence society, to influence the world with the gospel. And so we should be using every avenue that we have available to do so. Because millions of people in this world are craving and seeking hope, and we have the hope they are seeking, so why are we not sharing the hope they are seeking? If we were truly doing what God has designed the church to do, people would have an answer to that question they're seeking. Don't worry if you're not driven or motivated by love. You can make that decision today to trust in Jesus and then you'll be driven and motivated by love. You can choose darkness over light. You can be what God desires you to be. This is not an infomercial. This is God's word. And he says that if you choose him, he will transform you into a new creation. And by the way, he continues to transform us, doesn't he? Sometimes we, some of us need more transforming than others, right? <laughs> The power that dwells on Most High. Guys, take comfort in that. Take peace in that. Know that our roots can be found in Jesus Christ. Oh, the God, this should be our prayer. This should be our prayer. God, that you would fill my soul with your love and compassion, that I may do mighty things in your name. Because let me tell you something, folks. I've did it for years. You cannot do mighty things in the name of Jesus without love and compassion. Colossians 2.7, now being built up in him. So recap, number one, we receive Christ. Number two, we learn to walk in Christ. Number three, we're firmly rooted in Christ. Then the foundation can be built. So there's some things that you need to do when you're building a house. You've got to get good concrete. You've got to lay good dirt. You need to make sure that the land is right. All these things to lay a good foundation. The same is with our relationship with Jesus Christ. If we don't receive him or believe in him and don't plant our roots deeply in him, then there's going to be some breaks in our foundation and we're going to find ourselves with our face on the ground wondering what happened. And so we have to be very careful with our lives. It's no joke. Oh, but it's so much fun. It's so much fun serving Jesus. It's so much fun. 1 Corinthians 3.11 For no man can lay a foundation other than than the one which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. Number five, an established type of faith is uncomfortable, but it's fruitful. Colossians 2, 7, established in your faith just as you were instructed and overflowing with gratitude. You see, we establish ourselves in Christ by reading his word, by praying, by meeting together. Look at Acts chapter two at the end. That's the model of the church. And we try to imitate that model. So all the aspects of worship that we do is so that we can glorify God even more together. The more we read, the more we seek him, the more in tune we are with him. Tomorrow morning, don't do that thing you were going to do first. Open up your Bible. Start reading something. And before you open up your Bible, ask God, God, what do you have to say to me this morning? How can I bring hope and peace in this world today? Because I don't know if it's my last day. I want to go out with a bang, Lord. Show me what I can do. 
We're not guaranteed tonight. We're not guaranteed tomorrow. So why are we waiting? What are we waiting for? Do it now. Start seeking his precious face. I mean, God designed you. He formed you in the womb of your mother. He loves you so much. The first thing he desires for your life is for you to be in communion with him. Our lives should resemble an outpouring of gratitude. By the way, this is a byproduct of an established faith in Jesus Christ. We have this natural overpouring of gratitude in our life, and people see that, and they're attracted to it. How can we not be grateful? He snatched us out of death and placed us in life. He gave us a new soul. He gave us a new mind. He gave us new desires. No longer are we held captive by the sin of our previous life. We should be flowing with gratitude every day. But sometimes life gets tough. I know. I know it does. But that doesn't mean our one true hope can't be found in Jesus Christ and that we can walk through those painful times with him and choosing to be grateful for what we have. This overflow of thankfulness is like a river coming over its banks. By the way, you remember the Samaritan woman at the well? That little story in scripture? I wanna point something out to you. Do you remember how Jesus treated her? He didn't call her a man hopper, prostitute, he didn't say any of those things. He asked her questions, and he listened to her answers. Read the story. Jesus didn't tell her that she had to do anything or she was going to go to hell. She spoke to her with respect, which Jews did not do in that time, by the way. Gentiles were considered low as dogs. Wouldn't even allow them to eat the crumbs off their table. But Jesus spoke to her with love and compassion. He answered her questions with kingdom answers. Think about that for a minute. So the next time you encounter somebody and you know the Lord's given you an opportunity to share that hope that you have, instead of giving a gospel presentation, influence them with the gospel through conversation. Listen to what I'm saying. If that person knows that you care for them, they will listen to what you have to say. But if they see you as this person just approaching them with a dogmatic view in theology and that nothing they say matters, they're going to be closed off to the true peace and hope that you have to give them. We have to love and we have to have compassion. I think a perfect example of this was a guy named Charles back in 2015. Oh, sweet man. Me and a friend of mine used to visit them every Saturday night at the Sugar Bowl Motel and we'd just sit with them and talk to them and... and have a good time and cut up. Him and his wife, they were fun to be around. They always argued, but it was like a fun argue, you know. So we just laugh and, and have a good time. We did that for a year, every day, every Saturday for a year. And that following year, Ronnie came out with us and a couple of people down at the Sugar Bowl Motel, Ronnie and Renee, and they walked up to Charles. Charles was dying from cancer. And he had a prayer blanket over him that some ladies in church had sewn for him and prayed over and he was in bed for a few days, you know, just on oxygen and just not doing so well. His mouth started to dry and started to cave in. You know, you know the look. But they walked up to him and, and, and said, Charles, you, you ready? You ready to accept Jesus? You know what he said? Yeah, I'm ready. I'm ready. You know why he said yeah? Because God's children were being obedient, loving on people for the gospel's sake. So this is the question I have for you this morning. Is the living water inside of you a trickle? Or is it a mighty river? When people are around you, do they, do they get wet by that Holy Spirit inside of you? Or is it just a trickle and you're grasping for air? You're so dry, you just have nothing left. Which one are you? My friends, I want to tell you this morning that you can get rid of all that baggage that you have, that you can get rid of all those burdens that you've been holding on to for all eternity, that you can place your hope and trust in Jesus Christ and the work on the cross and be free this morning. No longer do you have to hold on to this feeling of impending doom that you may have because there's hope. The mark of a mature Christian is someone abounding in thankfulness. 
and thankfulness. You ever met someone and you just get agitated because they're so thankful? Like you, you say, hey, how you doing this morning? Oh, I'm doing great. Woke up this morning, shaved my face, you know, wife gave me a kiss. I'm good to go. You know, I'm like, man, I wasn't asking for all that, <laughs> right? But there is some principle to that. When we're talking to lost people, when we're communicating amongst one another here, there needs to be encouragement and love with one another because we know where our roots are planted. We know where our roots run, and they run in Jesus Christ. You see, when you receive Christ, you learn to walk in Him, you learn to firmly root yourself in Him, and you establish yourself in faith in Him. And so when you have no money, we're thankful. When we lose our job, we're thankful. When we come, with a, come up with a disease, we're thankful. When we don't get our way, we're thankful. Everything in our life can be going opposite of the direction we feel it should go, but we're still thankful because God has given us access to a water that we won't thirst again. It's called the living water. It's called the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's a great thing. Take heart and place your burdens on Jesus today. Maybe you're here for the first, second, third time, and you've never placed your trust in Jesus Christ. God is calling you out of that seat this morning to make a public declaration of who Jesus is in your life. You can do that this morning. You can say, God, I am with you. I am not of the world anymore. God, I don't want these burdens. I don't want anything that's going on in my life. I want you. Lord Jesus. I want your sweet spirit inside of me. I want you to change my desires. I want you to change my passions. And I want to be on fire for you, God, because I know that you died for me. And I believe in you today. And I will believe in my heart that you rose from the dead. You can do that today. Don't be crippled with fear. Step out into that uncertainty where Jesus is calling you. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for your word. I thank you for who you are in our life. God, right now in this moment, as heads are bowed, I know there are souls in this room, Lord, that are thirsting for that living water. God, they are thirsting for that eternal security in you. And God, I pray that they would not let another day go by, that they would not let another moment go by, but Lord, that they would step out in faith to you, to trust you as their living God. Father, I pray for those in here that may have a relationship with you, but they're, they're just inundated with burdens and, and impending feelings of hopelessness. God, I pray that they would step out and that they would make a choice to give you those burdens this morning, trusting that you have their best interest at heart. In Jesus' name, amen.